Well, that was a rather ominous beginning to the program. Quite frankly, Christians are not even going to experience much of what you heard because that's going to be happening in the tribulation. We'll explain that as we move into the programming. We're going to consider heavily for this hour two apocalyptic players, a diabolical duo, the Antichrist and the false prophet. Are they alive? Well, they may be. They certainly haven't been anointed yet as the church remains here. All of the end of days drama, and I'm speaking of God's wrath now, and there's plenty of man's wrath going on today on the earth, but I have always maintained as to my guests that God never beats up his bride with his wrath. That would be during the tribulation. He's not beating up his bride. The tribulation takes place while true believers are enjoying heaven. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to play, it's a very short clip here, of Mark Hitchcock. There are about a hundred passages in the Bible that deal with this coming world ruler, the Antichrist. Say, so, say again, how many? Uh, about a hundred. Wow. Yeah, and so people will say, well, why even worry about the Antichrist? We're not even going to be here. Well, why did God tell us so much about this person? You know, I think one of the reasons God tells us a lot about the coming Antichrist is because we can already see the spirit of Antichrist today in we our can. world. Yes, we can. And also another reason I think God shares with us about the Antichrist is the Antichrist is going to ultimately be defeated by God. And if God is going to defeat someday the greatest concentration of evil that's ever existed, then that gives us comfort that he can take care of the evil we see in our world today. So I felt that Mark there both asked a couple of questions and answered a couple of questions because some might ask, you know, why are we bothering with talking about characters that true believers are frankly never going to meet? On earth is playing out the tribulation and the great tribulation, seven years of unbelievable trauma on earth. And yes, we've talked a lot about that here in the last several weeks and months. And that is because the final day events are converging so rapidly. And if we are seeing the events that could clearly signal the second coming of Jesus Christ, how much sooner will it be that the Lord raptures believers to heaven? Currently, there is a setup for this time of Jacob's trouble, also called Daniel's 70th week, also known as the Tribulation and the Great Tribulation. So I'm going back this week to Terry James' newest book, which is titled Trajectory, Tracking the Approaching Tribulation Storm. He's the general editor. There are 17 contributors, including my guest for the hour, Jeff Kinley. I'll say more about Jeff as we go into the hour. You've heard him on this program many times. You see him on his channel and other places. Jeff, welcome back to the program. Jan, thanks so much for having me. In my lifetime, I have not seen the spirit of the Antichrist so active. Now, Christians will see the spirit of the Antichrist. We won't see the Antichrist. We're watching the spirit of the Antichrist. Absolutely. I think it's like a levy that's starting to leak we're seeing more and more of the spirit of Antichrist leaking through into our culture, into our government, into our world. That's causing discerning believers to wake up and go, wait a minute, we really are in the last hour, as John said in First John 2.18. Now, you have suggested in your chapter that just like Hitler needed Himmler, the Antichrist will need a cohort known as the false prophet. You call them a devilish duo. I think that is appropriate. Let's stick with the Antichrist for now. I'm going to morph into the false prophet later in the hour. You call him a spiritual predator. Why? Because he preys upon those created in God's image, because Satan, from the day that he rebelled in heaven, has always wanted and desired and longed to be worshipped. He wants to be God. And of course, the only choosing volitional animals that he can find are human beings. And so he wants to prey upon humanity. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy so for that reason, Satan wants to gather these worshipers around him, which the Bible says he'll successfully do in the end of time. And you feel he will be a Gentile. I would agree with you, but why don't you explain why you feel he'll be Gentile, not a Jew? Well, it says he rules over a Gentile kingdom, over the revived Roman Empire. It says he rises from the sea of the Gentiles. That's one reason. Another reason is because, to me, it's unthinkable that any Muslim would claim to be greater than Allah. And that is the number one tenet in the Islamic faith. And also for the Jews as well, it doesn't seem to be very feasible that a Jew would come and commit the abomination of desolation in the Jewish temple. So it seems more plausible, I think, from Scripture that he'll be a Gentile. People seem to get a kick out of, and it's tempting to do, I will acknowledge, 
speculating on this man is roaming about the earth now. They've suggested Hitler. They've suggested Emmanuel Macron. They've even suggested Volodymyr Zelensky. They've named Barack Obama. They've named now King Charles III. And we need to emphasize that no one has the code to unlock this mystery. That is a futile endeavor. Oh, absolutely. And in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, make it clear that only after the restrainer is removed, and I take the restrainer, Jan, to be the unique influence of the Holy Spirit during the church age, through the church, the bride of Christ, only when that restrainer is removed, then it says the next verse, then the lawless one will be revealed. And I think we can confidently say there have been many antichrist-like figures, people that exhibit certain characteristics that we do see, Scripture saying, will be a part of the Antichrist. I sometimes say the Antichrist will have the charisma of a John F. Kennedy, the mystique of a Barack Obama, but the arrogance of an Alexander the Great. And he's going to really combine all of the evil personas that we have perceived the Antichrist to be into one person. And I don't think anyone of the world has yet to conceive of how incredibly evil and sinister and diabolical this one man will be. Just going to play a real quick clip. It happens to be you and Billy Hollowell, and you're having an interesting discussion here that I want to play off of when we come back. An Orthodox bishop in Ukraine also had something to say about this that sort of put it in the headlines. He said that Putin um, essentially is a modern day antichrist. And so that got a lot of people, again, sort of thinking, wondering on this topic. Let's start there. What is the antichrist? Well, the Antichrist is talked about in Scripture. The word Antichrist occurs about five times. Of course, he's known by many other names, but he's depicted as an end times figure who will arrive in the last days, uh, who will be in prominence during the uh, the last seven years of Earth's history. And he will basically be a global leader. He'll be the global leader of the planet. And it's very interesting that how people would characterize Putin as Antichrist because The Antichrist actually arrives on the scene. His prominence is not through invasion or through war, Billy, but it's through peace, a platform of peace. I mean, Revelation 6, 1 uh, makes that clear that he comes with a bow, but no arrows. And Daniel 9, 27 says he really kind of launches his career based on a peace covenant that he makes with the Jewish people, Daniel 9, 27. So he really, in that sense, is really unlike the Antichrist. I think 147 countries are right now deploring Putin's invasion of Ukraine. So not welcomed by the world like a savior, but more uh, like put down like the bully that he is. Jeff Kinley, I think the Bible suggests, I'm sticking with the theme of that clip we just heard here, but some people suggest, because the Bible suggests, that the Antichrist is going to sort of rise from obscurity. He's the little horn. He may not be prominent at all until he's coronated. Am I right there? I think so. Right now, Satan is not allowed to reveal the identity of the Antichrist. He would love to go ahead and jumpstart the tribulation, but I think his identity is veiled right now for many different reasons. Obviously, one is if the Antichrist were known, people would try to kill him. But I think that as we look at Scripture, Scripture makes it very clear that we're not going to know who Antichrist is. So it's really kind of a futile speculation to try to think, well, this man could be the Antichrist. I think he's hidden right now. He may be in some form of government, but I don't think he's a prominent player on the world global geopolitical scene right now. That concurs with my thinking. I wasn't sure if I was on the right track there, but right now the world's in just a horrific mess from crime to political corruption, from pandemics, famine, drought, the threat of nuclear war in Eastern Europe, which obviously could spread globally, World War III, a dirty bomb they're talking about. The news doesn't get much more grim. So Obviously, all of these issues are setting the stage for Mr. Fix-It to come in and fix some of these messes. And as Henry Spock said all the way back in 1957, he was a part of NATO back in 57 because the world he thought was a mess back then. He said, give us God or the devil, we're going to receive him. Well, in this case, they're going to receive the devil, the Antichrist. That's absolutely true. And the stage really is being set. I mean, it's one crisis after another that's occurring all over the world. And as we saw with COVID, a particular crisis can really circle the planet faster than a hypersonic missile, Jan. It's so fast how quickly things can change. And so we're living in that day of hyper-technology, hyper-communication, and because nations are cooperating on different levels in an unprecedented way, then the next big crisis that occurs really could bring the world together 
and lay the final groundwork for Antichrist to rise from the scene. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. I have on the line author Jeff Kinley. Learn more at jeffkinley.com. He is a part of the Prophecy Pros podcast team with Todd Hampson. Find that online. We'll give more instructions on that in a moment. But the reason I'm talking to Jeff this hour is I've been featuring Terry James' newest book, Trajectory, Tracking the Approaching Tribulation Storm. Folks, it is outstanding. I have a privilege of writing a testimony on the very front cover of this book. Thank you, Terry. That was kind of you to ask me. But contributors include Tim Moore and Pete Garcia, Dave Reagan, Nathan Jones, Todd Strandberg, Jeff, of course, Wilfred Hahn, Jonathan Brentner, Mike Jedron, Bill Salas, a number of others, 17, but we'll feature some of those here on Understanding the Times Radio. Find it in my store, olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org, or call my office. I'm going to read a paragraph. Bear with me, okay, one short paragraph that Jeff writes. He says here in his chapter, the Antichrist will lead the nations together in unity on the heels of the 2020 COVID crisis. Calls for global unity came forth from a host of current and former world figures. Though not fully successful, they did manage to greatly raise global awareness among nations Namely, that in order to defeat a worldwide threat, in this case a viral pandemic, there must be international cooperation and unity. Now Jeff says this, I believe the rapture and the ensuing chaos will raise the global level of emergency to the degree that one man will be able to seal the deal and finally bring them together. This multinational coalition will, in many ways, fulfill the vision of the current European Union, the World Economic Forum, and other international entities. Specifically, Antichrist's world government will consist of 10 primary nations that mirror the former geographical and political dominance of the former Roman Empire, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, etc. Your comment on what you've just written, Jeff? We're talking about the crisis that comes after the rapture, and the world has never seen anything like what the rapture is going to produce. If you think about where Christians are across the world in every strata of society, in some countries, I think it'll essentially gut their governments, their military, the arts, the education, entertainment, so many Christians that are a part of culture. So in some countries, it's really going to implode the country. Other countries will be much less affected, but at the same time, the entire world will go into a spiritual blackout, and there will be panic on an unprecedented scale the world has never seen before, and it will cause governments to begin scrambling together to look for solutions. In that chaos, in that mire of confusion, I believe one man will step forward and say, look, I've got an idea here. And everyone's going to say, where have you been all our lives? So he's going to bring that sense of calm, that sense of peace. And then, of course, when he signs this peace treaty with Israel, it's going to really seal the deal and start the clock on the tribulation period. And we need to clarify, again, the rapture does not start the tribulation. It's going to be this peace treaty, Daniel 9:27, between the Antichrist and Israel. That actually starts the tribulation. I'm going to throw a little monkey wrench in here, Jeff Kinley. And I'm going to play a very short clip. It happens to be Joel Richardson. And he's going to introduce the concept of an Islamic Antichrist. I don't think you or I go along with this at all, but we need to explain why, because a lot of people have embraced this. Let's play this clip and then come back and talk about it. Millions of Muslims around the world are awaiting the appearance of an Islamic Messiah known as the Mahdi or the 12th Imam. Various branches of Islam have differing beliefs about the Mahdi. Shiite Muslims, for example, believe their savior was once alive but disappeared and will emerge a second time from this well located in a small village in Iran. Sunni Muslims also believe in a savior, but they believe the Mahdi is Muhammad's successor and is yet to come to earth. Author Joel Richardson has written several books on how Islamic beliefs relate to biblical prophecy, and his research suggests that the Mahdi of the Muslims and the Antichrist spoken of in the Bible are the same person. In his book, Mideast Beast, Richardson argues that the Antichrist will come from the Middle East and not from Europe, as has been widely taught by many modern prophecy teachers. 
Uh, for more on this, author Joel Rich Richardson is now joining us. Well, let's, let's get right into it, Joel. Um, you say the Mahdi is the Antichrist. Why do you say that? Well, when you look at Islamic tradition, sacred tradition, as they describe their primary Messiah figure, the Mahdi, there's numerous striking similarities to what the Bible describes with regard to the Antichrist. They believe he'll rule for a period of seven years. They believe he'll rule specifically from Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. Um, they believe he'll be a religious, military, political leader that will cause Islam to be supreme throughout the world, uh, filled with anti-Semitism, anti-Christ, anti-Christian uh, spirit and, and doctrine. It's, it's amazing how the two concepts, messianic concepts, really line up in a, I call it an anti-parallel. What would you say to, to someone who, who would say, well, this is just another type? Uh, how can a Mahdi, uh, a, a Muslim Messiah, how could he bring the whole world under his sway? Well, first of all, I don't know that he's going to necessarily bring every single last nation under his sway. The scriptures are clear that there will be nations that will be at war with the Antichrist till the very end. Um, so a lot of people talk about him having this global rule. I think it's going to be a massive rule. I think throughout the world right now, you have Muslims in every nation, some nations much more than others. I think if the Muslim majority nations of the world were unified together, that alone would be enough to fulfill the prophecies of the Bible. But you throw in some wild cards, you throw in wars and, and so many other things. And I think that Islam is uniquely custom tailor made to fulfill that which the prophets were speaking about, whether geographically, whether theologically, whether it's their anti-Semitism, whether it's their numbers. Uh, in so many ways, I think that we can say that this is that beginning to emerge right before us. So, Jeff Kinley, my issue with what I just heard from Joel Richardson is this. I find it really hard to believe how the Jews are going to deal with an Islamic Messiah because they're actually going to get along fairly well for three and a half years. The Antichrist and the Jews are going to interact fairly well. He's going to have a peace treaty with them. What are your thoughts here? I would concur with that. First of all, the fact that the Jews would accept essentially an Islamic Messiah to me would be unthinkable, especially when you consider that in Israel right now, there is a rising orthodoxy. The Jews want to build their temple they want to worship God, Yahweh. They don't want to worship the Muslim God or someone that represents him. It seems that as a trajectory of the Jewish people tend to be a little more orthodox toward the end times in terms of returning back to their ancient faith, that they would not accept an Islamic Messiah figure. Secondly, I would say this, that the Quran cannot predict the future. We don't take our cues from Islam or from the Quran, but from the Holy Scriptures as far as who this person is going to be. And of course, the Quran would want the Islamic Mahdi, their savior, to be this Antichrist figure because he would rule over the Jews. So that makes perfect sense. Another thing that a lot of people don't understand, Jan, is that at some point this war of Gog and Magog is going to happen, yes. Ezekiel 38 yes. 39. And I believe it's going to happen right around the time of the signing of that peace treaty. If that's true, then this war is going to essentially decimate all Islamic dominance in the Middle East. So there really is no purpose for this person to be a Muslim at this point. Finally, I would say that the idea that a Muslim would do what Antichrist is going to do, which is proclaim himself to be above every god or so-called object of worship, Second Thessalonians tells us, is unthinkable, that he would claim to be above Allah. That is a thought that can't even enter the mind yeah. of a Muslim. We see that also in Revelation 13 and 17 tells us he's going to rise out of this sea of Gentile nations. So for those reasons, I would not personally lend a lot of credence to that view. More and more people are drifting in that direction, which is why I felt I at least had to bring it up. Yeah. Folks, as you're reading the Bible, you're going to be seeing references to the Antichrist all over the place. He's called the Little Horn, Daniel 7, 8. He's called the Insolent King, Daniel 8, 23. He's called the Prince Who Is to Come, Daniel 9, 26. The One Who Makes Desolate, Daniel 9, 27. He's called... The king who does as he pleases, Daniel 11, he's called the foolish, worthless shepherd, Zechariah 11. He's called the man of lawlessness, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, the son of destruction, the lawless one, of course, the Antichrist, the deceiver. And again, he is talked about repeatedly in the Bible. 
Obviously, God wants us to know about him, though true believers will never meet him, thankfully, because we're enjoying heaven while he is ruling in his new world order for seven years on earth, a very ignominious new world order, by the way. So I think then, Jeff, we have to assume that there is a gap between the rapture and the start of the tribulation. How long? Weeks, months, certainly not years, but could it be weeks to months? I think it could be weeks to months because there's going to have to be some time for this crisis to play out, but also there's going to have to be some time for this Antichrist figure to begin to coalesce the nations together. There'll have to be meetings, there'll have to be travel, there'll have to be repairs, there'll have to be emergency actions that'll have to be taking place on every level of every government. So some time has to take place. We don't know if it's going to be weeks or if it's going to be months. I'm like you, I don't think it's going to be years, No. simply because of how fast the world changes right now. I think Satan is going to see that as his opportunity. I think that's going to be the gate that opens, and God's in his sovereignty say, all right, now I'm going to allow you out of the gate, and the Antichrist is going to rise up. But I think it's going to happen quickly. I'm going to play one more clip of you and Billy Hollowell. You're talking about, again, the beast who rises out of the sea. Revelation 13, 1 says that the Antichrist will rise out of the sea, which many take that to mean the area around the Mediterranean Sea or the old Roman Empire. And so it's really more so a European origin than it is more of a Slavic or a Russian origin in that sense. And so I would place the Antichrist more among the Sea of Gentiles and the revived Roman Empire as opposed to the north. Uh, And of course, we know in Revelation 17, verse 15, it identifies the sea, that imagery of the sea as being those Gentile nations. The Bible makes it very clear in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, that the Antichrist will not be revealed to the world, uh, his identity rather, until the restraining influence is removed. In other words, whatever is holding back Antichrist right now has to be as more powerful than Antichrist, more powerful than Satan. And so I believe that it must be the Holy Spirit's influence through the church today. And so because of that, I don't think we can really know who the Antichrist is definitively right now. And if you do know who he is, then bad news, you're in the tribulation period. Well, I appreciated that comment, Jeff. So you and I are holding back the Antichrist, correct? Absolutely. In fact, I often tell people when I speak at conferences that just by being here as a believer, you're making a difference. Mm -hmm. The fact that you are present on the planet, that you are stemming the tide of evil. Jesus said, you're the salt and you're the light and light exposes and salt preserves by being here. But also, Jan, by the things that we do, even in the political realm, the things that we're doing to help our country to keep from completely self-destructing, but most of all, through sharing the good news and the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are preserving humanity and holding back the tribulation. You say this, I'm quoting you here, the Antichrist will inspire people to believe that he can lead the world to a better place. That's laughable in my mind, in your mind, but to the people who are left behind, that will not be laughable. Absolutely not. In fact, they will be at a point where they're ready to receive, as you said earlier in that quote by Henry Spake, a devil or God. It doesn't matter. They're ready because they're hurting so badly. They need help. You talk about stimulus package. When our country rolls out these stimulus checks for people, they can't wait to receive those things. There's going to be a massive provision, I believe, through not only the peace that he accomplishes in the Middle East, but what other parts of his agenda, yeah. the Bible doesn't tell us, but it does tell us that he's going to be someone that the planet will eventually follow. And then, of course, at the midpoint of the tribulation, Jan, when he essentially rises from the dead after suffering this fatal head wound, this is going to be the final sign, the final deception that will convince people beyond a shadow of a doubt, this man is God in human flesh. And he is here for us, so let's do whatever he says to do because he's our Savior. To summarize, and again, I'm taking this out of Jeff Kinley's chapter in Trajectory, tracking the approaching tribulation storm, and you say, to summarize, the Antichrist will be one, a man of supreme self-confidence, two, a man of powerful persuasion, three, a man who is a friend to Israel initially, Folks, not likely to be a Muslim, okay? Four, a man who is the architect for global unity. That's a summary of this man of lawlessness, this man of sin, who, again, believers will never meet, and we can thank the Lord for that, but he's got a pal. There's a dynamic duo. They don't operate without one another, and that's a man called the false prophet. 
We're going to look at him in part two of our program. Could it be a pope? I mean, it's possible. There are a few clues in the Bible about the false prophet, though, again, we cannot know. So speculation is intriguing, but probably won't get us very far. I'm coming back in a minute or two. Don't go away. There are actually two beasts we read about in Revelation 13, and it's the same word used to describe both of them. It's the Greek word therion, which means a wild, ravenous beast. And it says that the second beast that later is identified as the false prophet is one that is called another beast. And that word another means another of the same kind. It's the word alos there. In other words, he's in the same vein of character as the first beast. The Bible says he gets his energy, his authority from Satan himself. And so both of these beast uh, figures, uh, but the, the false prophet beast here, it says that he has Uh, Two horns like a lamb. In other words, he comes on very uh, gentle and very alluring, but it says he he speaks like the voice of a dragon. So he's going to have that same uh, adversarial tone. He's going to attack the world, attack Christians, attack uh, Jews. And also he's going to be the one that's going to enact what we all know as 666 or the mark of the beast. He's going to be the one to basically enforce that worldwide. So he is the spokesperson of the Antichrist. He's his henchman, his right-hand man, his PR campaign a representative. Uh, he basically promotes him to the world. There, there have been some speculations among some that that beast might be a religious leader himself, you know, that or yeah, that that person is going to point people or maybe have a lot of people following. So it's very easy to sort of point back to the Antichrist and say, worship, worship here. What's your take on that idea? I think it's certainly possible that he could be an existing religious figure. Um, Obviously, it's impossible to identify that person or say it's going to come from here or he's going to be this type of person. But it's possible he could already have a religious resume, uh, a platform, something that he could use in helping uh, to uh, bring the world to himself. But by the same token, the flip side of the coin, Billy, is that there's going to be an event, Revelation 13 tells us, that essentially is going to set up the false prophet to be able to uh, lead this worldwide religious fervor for the Antichrist. And the scripture tells us that the Antichrist will suffer a fatal head wound and will essentially rise from the dead. And that will captivate the attention of everybody on planet Earth, as you would expect it would. Uh, And of course, having brought peace to the Earth uh, initially, and now he's raising from the dead. Now he's saying, I'm God, worship me. And so the false prophet really is, he has the ball teed up for him uh, to be able to take that event and that that phenomenon uh, there to, uh, to make the world worship the Antichrist. Welcome back. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. And just a couple of comments here. We had Jeff Kinley here in the Twin Cities back in June, along with Mark Hitchcock. And at the time we were introducing their very new book back then on the Great Reset, we carry that book. It is outstanding. We have had almost 300,000 views of that event online, various places online, YouTube, Rumble, our website. And then we have a DVD of that event in my online store for just $10. So if you'd like to look into that event and the information contained in the book or the presentation given back in June on The Great Reset, please look into it. We charge no shipping for any of the products we send out in the U.S. or Canada. And then let me give a very quick heads up here. Again, I'm asking for a call to action here because all ministries are having copycats on social media. I heard Amir Sarfati talking about it recently, fake accounts on his social media. And you've heard me warn you that there are at least 500 fake olive tree videos on YouTube. You can help. You can report them to YouTube. If enough of you would do that, take action, and report them to YouTube, Perhaps these frauds would be shut down. Most of them are from China or from Thailand, and they're doing very dangerous things online. You can always watch our videos on Rumble, on our website, on LightSource. We have a tremendous YouTube audience. It's 179,000 subscribers, and that's how you can tell if you're listening to our channel. All these copycats have 1,000 subscribers or 5,000 viewers. They're still doing an enormous amount of destruction, and I keep hammering at it because some of you are so confused. I don't blame you. I'm not being judgmental here. I'm just trying to clarify. Let's move ahead. I opened part two here with a clip of Jeff talking about this so-called false prophet. 
Jeff, you call these guys the diabolical duo. The goal of the false prophet is to have everyone worship the Antichrist. Am I right there? Yes, absolutely. In fact, that's his ultimate end game because that's Satan's ultimate end game. Revelation 13, 12 says he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. And so to worship the first beast, Revelation 13 tells us, is to worship the dragon himself. Talking to Jeff Kinley for the hour, basing my conversation on the new Terry James book, Trajectory, Tracking the Approaching Tribulation Storm. Jeff has an outstanding chapter in it, and that has been my guideline. So what kind of miracles do you think this false prophet will perform? You say the miracles will be observable, will be supernatural, will be verifiable, and believable. Talk to me about these miracles. Specifically, it tells us in Revelation 13, 13, it says, and he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. That could be an example of him destroying Antichrist enemies. But we do know this, that the same words that are used both here in Revelation 13 and in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 for signs, wonders, and miracles are the exact same Greek words that are used to describe the miracles in the ministry of Jesus and throughout the New Testament. The question is, are these going to be some of Satan's greatest deceptions? Or are they going to be actual supernatural miracles? And there's debate on either side of that, Jan. But the bottom line is it doesn't matter because the people will be convinced. I tell people that in the time of the era of tribulation, they will return to an era of overt supernatural activity, much like the New Testament, much like the Old Testament. It's going to be commonplace in everyday life primarily coming through this false prophet, the two witnesses of God, the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments. So this is going to be a time of the supernatural, and people are going to be affected by this, specifically here, to be deceived by these miracles of the false prophet. He's going to manufacture an image of the beast. Talk to me a little bit about that. We don't know exactly what this image is going to be. It could be something that is more of a hologram, could be something that is a stone statue. But again, the supernatural enters into it because at the end of Revelation 13, he says that he gives breath to the beast. He begins to speak and that the false prophet through this beast, perhaps because Antichrist can't be in the Holy of Holies of the Jewish temple, he puts the statue there as a representative of him. And this statue comes to life, as it were. And people will worship this statue, will worship the beast through the statue. It's going to be a bizarre time. But think about Nebuchadnezzar and his statue. Think about the Caesars and their statues. There's always been a representative of Satan's man on earth through some sort of physical representation. And of course, the Antichrist can't be everywhere at once. And so the statue will take his place in some parts. Only the false prophet is going to initiate this mark of the beast. In other words, I just want to clarify to some who are writing me. It cannot be present today. Somebody taking, let's just say, a certain medical procedure due to COVID did not take the mark of the beast. There is no beast, in other words, right now. Absolutely. In fact, in order to have the mark of the beast, you have to have the beast. We would have to identify the Antichrist in order for us to receive the mark of the beast. That's another reason why we believe Christians are not going to be present during the tribulation period, because that's during the time when Antichrist is revealed. I know you've had these questions. People ask me all the time, you know, was the vaccine the mark of the beast? And I say, no, regardless of your view on the vaccine, it was not the mark of the beast because Scripture tells us in Revelation 13, verse 16, it says that the mark will be on the hand or on the forehead, not under the skin or in the blood. So there's nothing internal. These chips that are in people's hands may be intrusive. They may be draconian. They may be futuristic, but they're not the mark of the beast. This time is going to be a time when this mark will either be the name of the beast or the number of his name. Mm -hmm. That's the very specific instruction in Scripture. We have to stick to what the Bible says on it and not jump ahead of God. Obviously, there is speculation, just as we talked about in part one of my programming. People like to try to figure out who's going to be the Antichrist. They like to figure out who's going to be the false prophet. Number one on the list is always a pope. And folks, we do not know, okay? It's interesting speculation. So I'm going to just play a short clip here. It happens to be Pastor Tom Hughes talking about this. I think Tom raises some really intriguing points here. The book of Revelation speaks of the last days when the false prophet, the leader of the final world religion, 
arrives on the scene. He will appear as a lamb, meaning he will appear very Christian, even Christ-like to those that are deceived. But he will speak like a dragon, meaning he will speak like the devil himself. Thinking of that, I've received several emails and even text messages over the past week regarding the statement that had come from the Pope. Uh, the statement was in regards to hell. In fact, on the headline of Drudge, the words were huge. The Pope says there is no hell. And repeatedly, I was asked the question, could this Pope be the false prophet? Here's how this went down. Last week, an Italian newspaper ran an article written by Eugenio Scalfari. He's an atheist and longtime friend of Pope Francis. The article purported to quote the Pope, and Scalfari is a well-known and highly respected Italian journalist. But he prides himself on never using the recorder in his interviews. He usually doesn't even take notes until the interview is over. So before we look at the quote, bear in mind that it's coming from a 93-year-old man going entirely on memory. Scalfari said he asked, what about bad souls? Where are they punished? He says the Pope replied, those who do not repent and cannot therefore be forgiven disappear. There is no hell. There is the disappearance of sinful souls. But that's not what Jesus said. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus said, It is better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet, to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never, did you get that? Never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And Jesus also said, There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And he said, there are people to whom he will one day say, depart from me, you cursed, into, get this, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Uh, Jesus talked about hell more than anyone else in the Bible. To deny hell is to deny his clear and obvious teaching. But did the Pope really say there is no hell? After the interview went public, the Vatican released a statement that the quote was the fruit of his, that would be Scalfari's, reconstruction and not a faithful transcription of the Holy Father's words. But that's a denial of specific words, not a denial of the thought behind those words. As of the time I record this, they have not told us what the Pope actually believes. A clarification should be simple. Just say the pontiff believes in hell. He believes people will suffer there and that the suffering will never end. The point, Jeff Kinley, is the intriguing thought that part of this dynamic duo is going to be a false prophet. Could it be a pope? The current pope is ailing, mainly due to age. If he were to serve, let's just say tribulation were to start in the next few years, he'd go well into his 90s. Perhaps a successor of his could be a candidate. Give me your thoughts on this. I think a couple things we could say. First of all, it very well could be an established world religious leader mm -hmm. that would assume this role. He could also rise from relative obscurity. He could be simply someone in government with incredible marketing and people skills. He could be someone that is youthful, that is energetic. The point we have to remember about the false prophet, Jan, is that his job is not to draw attention to himself, but to point people to the Antichrist, much like the Holy Spirit in this unholy trinity that we see with Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, the Holy Spirit points to Jesus, but not to himself. So his role is going to be to deflect attention from himself to Antichrist. In essence, who he is, I don't necessarily think matters. It's what he's doing and the abilities that he has to do that. Also, when you consider the fact that much of the world has an anti-Catholic sentiment, not following Catholicism, it's not the world global force that it once was, so the issue here is more on the role of the false prophet and not his background or where he came from. I think what I'd like to do, Jeff, and by the way, again, I've taken our conversation and thoughts out of the new book, Trajectory, Tracking the Approaching Tribulation Storm. Terry James is the general editor, and I'm very honored to have a testimony on the front cover of the book because the contributors are absolutely outstanding. Let me just ask you a few current event questions, Jeff. 
You're ministering at some prophecy conferences. You were at Futures, which I was privileged to be at in 2021. I know the interest level in Southern California. I believe folks came from far distances to that conference. You told me you've just ministered in Brazil. And before I get to some specific questions, tell me what kind of enthusiasm are you encountering when you talk to people in person about some of the issues we're discussing and many more? Despite what a lot of people might want to think, Jen, I'm experiencing right now a real rising remnant in the body of Christ of people who are hungry. They're starving for truth. They're not getting it in many of their churches. Some they are, but many of their churches. So they're seeking out They know that the world is, from their perspective, coming apart. Of course, we know God would bring it all together in his plan. So I'm seeing a rising, energetic, full of hunger remnant in the body of Christ right now. And that's why we're seeing prophecy conferences are popping up. We're seeing attendance at them swell, this futures conference. You couldn't have shoehorned another person into the room. People are so hungry. So yeah, I'm seeing very positive signs among the bride. I think the bride is waking up little by little. And of course, your show and others like it play a great part in that. And you've got Prophecy Pros. How can folks access the Prophecy Pros podcast? You can listen to it on any of your platforms for podcasts. Go to prophecypros.com. Prophecypros.com. And you can communicate with Jeff at Jeff Kinley, K-I-N-L-E-Y, jeffkinley.com. Jeff, 2022 is winding down. It's been an astounding year, not the happiest projecting into the new year in the natural could be terrifying. We know God has these things under control and things have to fall into place. That's certainly my mantra. What are a couple of the most stunning events of the current year as they relate to the Bible? And again, the options are numerous. The coming digital currency, which isn't here yet, but it's in the making. We've got potentially nuclear conflict, believe it or not, here in 2022 in Eastern Europe. Give me your thoughts on what has struck you here as we wind down 2022. Obviously, the continued escalation in Ukraine is certainly something to keep our eyes on. We have American troops that are massing close to the border there. We've got 147 different nations that are looking at this situation. Anytime you have the nations of the world, Jan, focused on one thing, that screams global unity. And this is something around which they can come together. And of course, then again, there could be a leader to come into that mix to bring about some sort of peace and situation. But I think this could escalate as Putin has threatened some sort of nuclear option. And the Bible doesn't tell us that before the rapture, there won't be some sort of thermonuclear explosion or some conflict between nations like that. So that's something to watch right now. And that certainly dovetails into the prophecies of Ezekiel 38, 39, with Russia moving south, continue to plant her footprint there in that area, and obviously eventually moving down to Israel in that war. Another thing, as you mentioned, was the economic crisis we're experiencing right now that I believe is planned. It's something that I call a controlled demolition. It seems to be that the solutions are right before us. We're not doing any of the solutions. Combined with that, Jan, is this executive order that Biden gave back in March March. of this year, Mm -hmm. exploring the possibility of a central digital bank currency, which basically means that every transaction on the planet can be traced. You can program money. You can cause money to expire. And it essentially gives the government the ability to digitally direct and control your life. And of course, that sets up the whole economy, I believe, for Antichrist, because in order for the mark of the beast to have an effect, you have to have control over all the economy. These are things that are, again, laying the groundwork. We don't know how fast these things will come, but we know that they could happen very fast. This is something that could happen in a matter of months. Some are saying that this whole digital experience is going to be launched. They've even set a date of December 13th. Others are saying, no, that it's going to be spring of 2023. I think it's up to Biden and associates when they want to launch this digital dollar. It means money as we know it, as you've already stated, everything's going to change. Jeff, this is going to so shock some people. Once it hits, I think many are thinking we're exaggerating or stretching things a little bit here, but we are not. No, and these things are going to be sold on the platform of the benefits to us, that it's going to cut down on crime. You don't have to wait for that check to clear. It's Mm -hmm. going to clear immediately because of how fast things work. As we've seen with all the other crises, and what we're seeing this pattern, Jan, is that there's crisis that leads to chaos, and then the government comes along, gives you calm, 
we then comply to it. But the end game is always control because Satan is driving this world narrative from a secular standpoint, and his end game is control. All of these things eventually play out into that end times agenda that Satan has. It remains to be seen what effect our midterm elections are going to have on this. The conservatives fighting back on these things. Some things that Biden has tried, like the disinformation system that he tried to set up, have failed miserably. There are ebbs and flows in these things, but we certainly do know that he's pushing forward that agenda. You've got this outstanding other book that we haven't even covered in this hour because we're focusing on trajectory, but you have this book on the reset and the rise of the Antichrist kingdom. Where might you see that going as we enter into 2023? We've got a few months yet before that's going to happen, but it's going to be here in a blink. What most people don't realize is that the World Economic Forum's agenda has already been downloaded into some of the greatest world leaders right now, into Macron, Trudeau, Mm -hmm. and even Biden. These people are disciples of the World Economic Forum. You're going to continue to see, I mean, Trudeau announced a ban on all sales of handguns and transference of handguns in this country. This is just another example of the kind of tyranny. Of course, the government will still have handguns. It's control, it's dominance, it's power. And these are incremental steps towards this overall satanic agenda that will see its fruition and fulfillment through Antichrist. Check out the book on the Great Reset that we carry. It's in our online store, Jeff Kinley and Mark Hitchcock. I think it's one of the best, explains what's up ahead. Jeff, I maintain that the reset is the tribulation, but we don't know that. That would mean the Christian may never even see this great reset. On the other hand, we're certainly seeing the stage setting for it. That's obvious. We really are. It's like different legs are going to land on different places in the global reset agenda. Of course, I think it'll find its ultimate fulfillment during that tribulation period. Here, Janice, what I think that Christians need to focus on. Number one, we need to be discerning individuals. The time for cultural Christianity, for compliant, comfortable Christianity is long gone. It's time to put our armor on, to Mm -hmm. stand up, to open our eyes, to see what Scripture says, to see the world as God sees it, not as Instagram says it is or TikTok. We need to see it through the lens of Scripture. And I'm definitely seeing that happen in the body of Christ, but we need more and more Christians to wake up to what's happening so they can live with discerning eyes. Very well said. Let me hit you with one last question here. How do you think the new King Charles III fits into this picture? We know he's a globalist. We know he's into the environment, the green agenda. In other words, the dear queen hung on as long as she could. But how do you think King Charles will fit in and change this scenario? Well, that's a great question. I know that prior to him becoming King Charles, he called for a world governance system on the heels of the COVID crisis. So certainly he's a fanboy of the World Economic Forum. What type of influence, what type of power he has remains to be seen. But I think we can say this, he's already on board with it. If this trend continues with all governments buying into the World Economic Forum agenda, he certainly could be a key player in that. We'll wait to see. The British people had some pushback on some of his climate agenda ideas, but we'll see just how far he's able to implement it as he moves forward with his monarchy. There are some pastors listening to us, Jeff Kinley and... I'm down to about two minutes or so, but some of the pastors listening may be intrigued. Others may be scoffing and mocking. They just hold different theology, that's Mm -hmm. all. But if you had a minute to exhort, and you've been a pastor for a number Mm -hmm. of years, what would you say to them? I'd say the Bible is your marching orders. It's your mandate. It's the only manual that God gave you to do what you're doing. Read your Bible, study your Bible, then go look at your world and see if you don't see the similarities. Finally, I would just say this. John said in 1 John 2, 18, little children, it's the last hour. Well, if it's the last hour then, we're certainly in the last seconds of humanity. How long that is, we don't know. But I'll just say this. We're deep in the fourth quarter. God has put the football into your hands, and God is counting on you to prepare his bride, to help purify her for the soon return of Jesus Christ at the rapture. That's your job. Don't fumble the ball. Score for the Lord. Folks, neither Jeff nor I want you to meet the Antichrist or the false prophet. And we've talked about that dynamic duo here for most of the hour. And to avoid meeting them, you need to name the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can do that. It's a simple procedure. It says in Romans, all who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. Just turn around, acknowledge you've been a 
let's be blunt. Let's just acknowledge you've really messed up life and you want to turn it all around. Let Jesus Christ do that. Come into your life. Make you a new creature. Jeff, thank you for all you do. I'm going out of the program with a comment here. And that is in the tribulation, Satan will have what he's always wanted. He will sit on the throne of God. He'll be worshipped as God and reign over an earthly kingdom instead of God.